aerodynamics is much misunderstood. You can't see it, it's hard to feel, sometimes hard to even measure, but yet we're constantly told just how important it is. Contrary to popular belief, the pursuit of improved aerodynamics has been going on a lot longer in the cycling world than just the last few years. But recently, every new tech development promises to save you watts. Presumably then, we're now much better at making stuff more aero. But how much? We're, we're gonna, gonna find, find out. out. This is a test we've wanted to do for ages, putting a dedicated time trial bike from yesteryear head to head against a cutting edge modern aero road bike. Have aerodynamics improved enough for a road bike to now be faster than a specialist time trial bike? But this is no ordinary time trial bike. In 1987, this was one of the fastest bikes on the planet. It won the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia in the same season under its rider. Stephen Roche. But then this is no ordinary bike either. This is the Ribble Ultra SLR. It might not have won a Grand Tour yet, but unlike the Batalin, this has really pushed the envelope of what people think an aero bike can actually do to make you faster. To find out how these bikes compare, we're going to do a good old fashioned race, a proper tear up here in GCN's Theatre of Dreams, a time trial circuit we've carved out of an area of empty and desolate wilderness in the south of England, known only as the Cotswolds. Well, we didn't carve it, Highways England did. But anyway, True. our race is a simple one. We're each going to ride both of the bikes on an 8.55 kilometre time trial course against the clock. Uh, although this course is slightly different from our usual one because we felt the gravelly potholed back road wasn't perhaps best suited to something 35 years old, a bit fragile and a bit temperamental. Yeah, and it wasn't just Ollie we were worried about, but the bike as well. Yeah, it's been loaned to us by Steve Grimwood from Elmy Cycles, which we are truly thankful for and we will look after as best we can. We've not gone full Stephen Roche here because, uh, well, we've got Wahoo power meter pedals rather than, well, slotted cleats and uh, we've got Wahoo head units so you can actually, can, bike computers didn't have those in the 80s. No. Anyway, I'm going to give you some beeps. Yeah. Beep, 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 beep. Whoa, 54, 10. <laughs> <laughs> This feels so weird. Like, it's super smooth, but it does not feel fast. While Sai is busy riding by the magic of TV, I'm going to stand here with the same bike and tell you a little bit more about it. So, it was made by the Italian Giovanni Battalin, who himself was a Giro d'Italia winner. Mainly it's my hand position, it's so wide, I feel like I'm riding a cyclocross bike. And the fact that they're so low means that my arms are really straight. And it's a prime example of what pretty much all time trial bikes of that era in 1987 looked like. It turns out Stephen Roach used 177.5 millimetre cranks which are massive. So my legs are at both the same time overextended and also about to hit me in the face. They differed from their road counterparts of the era by attempting to put the rider in a much more aerodynamic position. And they did this by being much lower at the front end. You can see you've got this tiny head tube and also a smaller front wheel than what you have at the back. This one's just 26 inches. And this kind of geometry with the, the smaller front wheel is known as a low pro. You've also got these bullhorn bars here which look quite strange compared to modern bikes.
How's he going? So fast, he's not even back from his warm up. Here he is. How was that? Wow. Hats off to this bike, right? Of all the of all the vintage bikes that I've been fortunate enough to ride in my time at GCN, this is by far and away the best example. Like it works flawlessly. Yeah, solid. Efficiency it? brakes. How comfortable is it with a 20 millimeter wide tire on it? Yeah, surprisingly so. But man, it does not feel quick. Like the main thing is I didn't know where to put my shoulders. It was like I was riding a cyclocross bike. Like my, you know, I just felt like my shoulders were just out like that. And all it took was to kind of go in the puppy paws position to be like, oh yeah, that's what it should be like. But that, well, I mean, it's illegal, isn't it? So I stopped. So low at the front. Whilst Ollie is out on course, let us talk through the differences between these two bikes. Now, unlike the Bataillon from 1987, which was very similar to its competitors, and it had to be because of the limitations of steel tubing, this Ultra is one of the most forward-thinking road bikes out there at the moment. And the differences between the two very much tell the story of how aerodynamic knowledge has progressed. Although, first and foremost, it has to be said, both bikes aim to put you, the rider, in a more aerodynamic position. This one is your typical road racing bike. So it's fairly long, fairly low, but nowhere near as extreme as the Bataillon. This is much higher at the front end so that your arms can be bent and therefore be in a more aerodynamic position. Interestingly, the bullhorn bars on the retro bike are 42 centimetres wide, centre to centre, which is massive for a bike trying to be aerodynamic. Back in the day, they thought that the key to being more aero was to go as low as possible. But now, we know that being narrow is also very important. And that's why on the Ribble, these bars are just 36 centimetres centre to centre at the hoods. So I'm holding on to them. But you can go even narrower if you want. There's a 33 centimetre wide option, which flares out to 37 at the drops. Then another huge contrast, perhaps the biggest, are the frame shapes. So on this Ribble, there is not a round tube in sight. And I know that because I've been looking. And it's for a very good reason, because whilst round tubes are structurally a really good shape to make steel as stiff and light as possible, they're aerodynamically really poor. In fact, so much worse than the Aerofall shape that the exposed brake cable outers on the Bataillon probably cause about as much drag as the whole head tube on this Ribble. But then simply making frame tubes into aerodynamic shapes was actually what cycling aerodynamics was like 20 odd years ago. Now it's about much more than that. It's about how the frame tubes interact with one another and also other parts of the bike. So for example, the front wheel, front fork, head tube, down tube area, and indeed how the down tube can then make the water bottle more aerodynamic as well. It takes countless hours of computational fluid dynamics. Computational fluid dynamics. to arrive at these complex shapes. Something that's only possible thanks to computers significantly more powerful than an IBM from 1987. But then that theory is then backed up with wind tunnel testing, something that was available in 1987 and was used by cyclists back then. But now we also have the additional benefit of meaningful real world testing too. Now it's worth noting that these shapes can't really be made out of metal, not if you want the bike to weigh less than an anchor, let alone be competitive. I mean, the frame on this is just over a thousand grams. This complete bike, about eight and a half kilos. As I said, that's only really possible thanks to carbon fiber. But the Ultra SLR has one more trick up its sleeve. Time will tell if other brands follow Ribble's lead here, but this bike is designed to be not quite as aerodynamic as it can be. And that's because Ribble's engineers have tailored the handlebars to create a little bit of additional drag so that you, the rider, then sit in an area 
of reduced drag, and specifically your knees and your legs. And Ribble say, therefore, that it makes bike and rider more aerodynamic by about 2% by their calculation. So over a 40 kilometer long time trial, ridden at about 35k an hour, it will work out as saving you about 23 seconds. And while some riders and some body shapes will get even more benefit than others, apparently in their real world and also wind tunnel testing, every rider saw a benefit. If you want to make your bike more aerodynamic, one of the easiest ways to do it is to fit narrower bars. And nowadays, it's rare that any self-respecting pro would choose bars as wide as 42 centimeters. Coming up to the end of the TT, crossing the line, now. So you can see then that with all of these developments, it is gonna be fascinating to know whether or not this bike, a road bike, is gonna be faster than that time trial bike. Not long to wait now. Right then, moment of truth, results time. Ollie, were you faster on the modern aero bike, the Ribble, or this vintage TT bike? Unsurprisingly, I was a lot faster on this. So power within a watt on both of them, 29 seconds quicker on this. 29 seconds That's quicker. That's huge, right? Over, Over eight, eight kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Huge. well, huge not actually as big as mine. I was really surprised because I thought it'd be way closer. I was 45 seconds faster on that one. 45? 45, yeah. I mean, I don't know, maybe I could, maybe I did an extra lap on this, I, I don't know. But genuinely, it felt so much harder for exactly the same power to sustain like over 40k an hour. That's it, you know, riding at the same power, but I had that same in, it, thing as well. The, the perceived exertion riding at that same power was far greater on that one. Yeah. I felt I had to work for it like so much more. Clearly like the aero thing is, is, is massive, you know, the tube shapes, not just the bike frame, but also having the, the deep, you know, aero front wheel here is gonna be really big over the, the narrow box section one. But, but you know, I think another massive difference is the, is the rolling resistance of the tires. Yeah. I, I like that is that's huge you know yeah. that's going to be conceivably like 10 watts at least and yeah well 20 millimeter tires as we know now and not far the only aerodynamic aid on this bike other than the fact that the cables run internally down the down tube which saves you a minuscule fraction of a watt this rear disc now i don't know much about disc wheels right so have, has disc wheel technology improved significantly in 35 years as yes. well? Yes. Okay, so how would you think this disc compares to an NV65? Well, it depends in, in the circumstances of the wind direction and what the wind is doing, because in certain yaw angles, certain wind conditions, it is possible for a wheel like this to actually uh, exhibit lower drag than, than a disc in certain scenarios. What? You know, for me, there's a couple of other big things going on here as well. Firstly, how impressive is it that riders of this era, Stephen Roach was able to go as fast as they went on bikes like this. Yeah. Well, you know, well, you know, when you tried to do a, a, a sub twenty minute time trial on a road bike. Yeah. The top guys back in the eighties were doing sub uh, twenty minute, ten mile time trials on bikes like that. That's bonkers. For yeah. Me. They're significantly, significantly <laughs> more powerful than me. But also. I've got to say, it's no surprise that Greg LeMond won the Tour de France when he stuck a pair of tri bars on this. Because, yeah. like, the difference between riding a set of 42 bullhorns and, like, a tri bar must be like a gazillion watts. So, um, so yeah, fair enough. But how cool is it that, that you're able not just to go faster than the specialist time trial bikes of yesteryear, 
in a straight line, but you get all of the other benefits as well. Like we are lucky to be part of this generation who can just go faster for exactly the same effort. Oh, it's, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I'll tell you what, right, I've, I've got, I've enjoyed riding that bike, but I, I think if we get 10,000 likes on this video, right, what we'll do is we'll get a, one of the Lotus bikes. Ooh, you know, like the board yeah. wheel, because they're supposed to be rapid. Because I want to see if one of those is faster or as fast as a modern aero road bike. So a, a UCI illegal time trial bike that was so fast they banned it yeah. against a modern aero road bike. Okay, we will make it happen somehow if we hit 10,000 likes. Yeah. Maybe Steve Grimwood from Elmy Cycles can, uh, <laughs> can find one for us. <laughs> uh, anyway. Let us know what you think. Hit the like button if you want to see that video happen. Huge thanks to Ribble for the loan of your Ultra SLR. That's yeah. one rapid bike. Yeah, I'm getting eaten by insects. Ah. The light, I don't know what they are, but the... If each one of these could hit a like button, I reckon we'd have about 100,000. We made a video recently where we took a time trial bike that had been used to win both the Giro d'Italia and Tour de France in the same season and put it head to head against a road bike. In that kind of race, a time trial bike would almost always be the clear winner. However, our time trial bike had been the fastest in the world in 1987, whereas our road bike was at the cutting edge of aerodynamics. The result was that the road bike was significantly faster. So we promised to come back and do it again, only this time with a more recent time trial bike, one that had a crucial technological development, aero bars. And the time trial bike we've got, is only blooming Greg LeMond, isn't it? Yes, our debt to Steve Grimwood, the owner of Elmi Cycles here in the UK, gets deeper by the month. This is another from his collection. And it couldn't be more fitting that it's Greg LeMond's because he is the man that's credited with introducing aero bars to professional racing. Famously, he used them to devastating effect to win the Tour de France in 1989, snatching victory on the final stage in one of all of sport's greatest upsets. The difference between Le Mans bike and his chief rival, Laurent Fignon, was these, this simple concept that we take for granted now, but back then was enough to overcome a 50 second time deficit in a 24 kilometer time trial and win the Tour de France. But is it faster than my aero bike? A Canyon Aero, undoubtedly one of the speediest out there, used by Matthew van der Poel to win the odd race and used by Annemiek van Vluten to win, well, every race. To find out which one is fastest, we've returned to our GCN Theatre of Dreams, our time trial course that's been settling age-old debates since the mists of time. 2020 does feel a little bit like that now, doesn't it? Well, I mean, it's a year from which people can only seemingly remember the, the global pandemic and me getting dropped in a GCN video. The, the damage from both, actually, arguably irreparable. Yeah. Well, gradually, we are recovering from the pandemic, aren't we? But still. Anyway, to settle the score, this is our standard 8.3 kilometre long time trial with just 60 metres of elevation difference throughout the whole route. It's fast. It's flowy and even at our lowly power outputs, we can still average well over 40k an hour. Yeah, and speaking of those lowly power outputs, we fitted power meters to both bikes and the plan is for us not to go absolutely flat out, we're going to ride at a power that is repeatable on both bikes to see which one is the fastest. Okay, you ready? Benchmark time. We're gonna ride our modern aero superbike. Cool. Pretty much, yeah. Shall we? I love doing tests like this. For work today, you need to ride your bike really fast. With pleasure. Really fast. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, can you bleep me in? Yeah. Beep, 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 beep. And he's off. Really fast. That looks really fast.
While Si is out on the course, as much as he'd like to disagree, I've got plenty of time to tell you about this incredible machine in more detail, including the tri-bars. So the frame is made by Bellato, a name that many of you won't be familiar with, but in bygone eras was a really big deal. They made steel frames for much of the pro peloton, often badged under different names. This is an example. Two of the biggest icons of the sport road Bellato frames, Fausto Coppi and Gino Bartoli. Like many time trial bikes of the time, the aero bit came courtesy of the very low front end, which is a result of having this smaller wheel, and then you've also got a disc wheel at the back. This kind of geometry, like the Bataille we rode before, is known as a low pro. You've also got these bullhorn bars, which we found last time on the Bataille, aren't very aero by virtue of them being so wide. But what sets this bike apart is its aero bars. Lamont himself had nothing to do with the development of the aero bars. And in fact, cyclists were a good three years late to the aero bar party. But he was a rider who was willing to give them a try. And the rest is history. So much so that in some parts of the world, these are known as Lamondis. Oh, Ollie, I think, I think size will be done. What do you mean? What do you mean he's nearly done? <laughs> Optimistic. Anyhow. This needs to be continued because the story of how these came into being involves a former US national ski coach and skiing engineer. Now my bike, in contrast, is all about making itself aerodynamic. So the tubes aren't tubes. They're all sculpted to be as aerodynamic as possible and also to work together to help smooth the airflow from the front to the back of the bike. And whilst my handlebars aren't aero bars, they are themselves aerodynamic. So they're an aero profile and they're also pretty narrow. But I quite fancy myself is having a decent position on this. And then there's the components as well. I've got Shimano's C60 wheels super deep, super aero, and then there's also the finishing touches of electronic Dura-Ace DI2 group sets, and also even tyre technology. So this whole bike should be faster. No sign of Sai yet. Thought he was uh, gonna be really fast. <laughs> what a load of rubbish. Here he is. Oh. How was that? Oh, that was good. Yeah? Oh, well, what's not to love about having a reason to just press on? Didn't get stuck behind a tractor. Didn't get stuck behind horses. It was good. Average 352. Not as metronomic as I was after. So there's a few little spikes and stuff, which I'm gonna have to factor in on that one. But that's great. Right, do you want to go? Yeah. You be careful with it, right? Yeah, I will be, yeah. But I mean, yeah, not a scratch. If you feel like you're getting a bit sweaty, just like back off or something. So, you know. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Oh. How did that take you by surprise? What on earth is he on about saying, don't sweat on it? I'm looking down, there's like a, a dried on crust, salt crust. He's a swell, he's, he's well, Sai is well sweaty. How's that? Oh, this bike's amazing. It is a good bike, isn't it? It's the first time I've like properly ridden the aerode, but oh, it's rapid. That thing's got its work cut out for it. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it right. does. Whew. 
Right, it's the moment of truth. It's time to ride Greg LeMond's bike and see if this, or developmental quantum leap as it was back in 1989, is enough to overcome 30 years of road bike innovation. That's right. I'm not going to lie, Ollie, I'm nervous. Not because of the results, nor because I'm riding a timeless piece of cycling history, but because the <laughs> owner of said timeless piece of cycling history is standing just over there. Steve, <laughs> uh, we'll be gentle. <laughs> right then. Should you do it? Yeah. I'm really interested. I don't, I think it's going to be close. I think it will be close. You know what? I did a bit of maths, right? right. Really shonky maths. So, Le Mans beat Fignon by 58 seconds. Yeah over 26 minutes, right? Our Batalin lost by 30 seconds over 13 minutes. So by that time trialer's logic, this potentially has the power yeah. to overcome that. Yeah. It will be close, won't it? Yeah. I feel Drop, like I'm beeps. riding a drag racer. Yes, right. please, yeah. Beep, 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 beep. Here we go. Oh, that's a big gear. There we go. <clears throat> There's one thing going through my head at the minute, and it's Greg Lamond in 1989. I'm channeling my inner Greg. <laughs> This position is insane, but it does feel quick. Can we just have a moment to appreciate one of the seismic shifts in performance between 87 and 91 was index gears. fight to hold the power this, this position oh. Oh. I feel like I've been stretched on a rack you look good look yeah fast. well I tell you what that's cool so I looked fast I definitely sounded fast this disc wheel it's unreal it's called cool. Disc jet, nothing to do with printers. It's like a jet engine. It sounds incredible. The Wolber. The Wolber disc jet, yeah. And then, but that position is so extreme. I was really struggling to get the power out. So I sat right on the nose. So it was killing my hip flexors. It was killing my bum. But I just, and if you sit properly, then, I mean, Le Monde must have been like, like a snake. He'd been able to stretch that far. But, it's cool. Well, it's I'm very cool. Looking... Right then, my aero friend. Channel 90s American rock and enjoy <laughs> the ride. Right. Honestly, you will. Trust right. me. Okay. All clear. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, God. Oh, it's not. It's a big gear. It is. I told you. Down, now, 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 So who did invent Le Mondes then? Well, the very first time a handlebar extension with armrests was seen was during the Race Across America in 1984 by a guy called Jim Elliott. But the invention went no further at that point than helping him to finish fourth. However, a couple of years later, the coach of the US national downhill skiing team, a guy called Boone Lennon, who was also a bike racer, rethought up the concept. This time though, he worked on it with a friend, a guy called Charlie French, who just happened to be an engineer at a fledgling skiing company called Scott Sports. The very same Scott that's now prolific 
in the bike industry. So the pair made their prototypes out of wood, proved their concept, and then moved the idea forward. Patents were filed, and in 1986, French himself used a pair of his aero bars to win the over 60s Ironman World Championships. The inspiration for these came from downhill skiing, and you can see the position I'm in now is that of a skier, albeit on a bike. Road cyclists were hard to convince, which doesn't sound like us, does it really? Slow to adopt new technologies. Anyway, it was three years later when Boone Lennon himself went to the Tour de France and managed to convince Le Monde mid-race to try his new aero bars on the final stage. And the rest? is history. Legend has it that Scott sold 100,000 pairs of these the very next year. And Charlie French, who is now 96, is still driving around in a Lamborghini. Hey, Greg. Oh, yeehaw! Oh, man. How was so, that? You're not wrong about that saddle and that <laughs> position. I'll tell you, if I'd, not, if I'd not watched your video on uh, sexual health and cycling, I'd be worrying right now that I've been rendered infertile. Yeah, as it is, you can rest easy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Not... Did it feel quick? What's the point? It's, it's a fast bike, yeah. Yeah. It feels It's so cool to ride it. It is so cool. Did to you ride have it. American rock music going through your head at all times, <laughs> picturing Greg LeMond coming down the Champs Elysees in 1989? Yeah, yeah, Stars and Stripes, all that. All, it was, yeah, yeah. Oh. Any? Can I ask you for a uh, for a wager? What do you reckon? Is it faster? No. Really? But yeah, we'll see. Okay, right. Let's let's press stop on your old Wahoo, and then uh, we'll wrap things up. We'll find out the results. Okay, Ollie. Yeah. What was the time difference for you? Canyon Air Road versus Greg LeMond's TT bike from 1991. Well, I did it in 11:45 on on the canyon, and then did it in 12:25. Whoa! On LeMond's bike. But slight caveat to that, I was about five watts down on LeMond's bike. So the was, position. I just couldn't get the power out in that position like the perceived rate of exertion was just way way higher because the hip angle so extreme like my, like my knees were in my chest again yeah. on that low pro bike and i just was dying <laughs> yeah yeah i was definitely hitting lunch every time i uh, my pedals were at the top of the stroke okay on mine okay so 11:38 on the canyon and 11:55 on Le Mans bike, so not quite as slow as yours in terms of the time difference, but still, I'm surprised it was as far apart as that. Like, I'm not surprised that it was slower, if I'm honest, but I'm surprised that the gap was as big as that. But then yeah. I suppose it's not just, you know, when I was riding along on, on my canyon, like those bars are 38 centimeters wide, like that's pretty narrow, isn't it? And yeah. when you can get your head tucked in, the position's not going to be vastly dissimilar. And then all the advantages, like that aero front wheel, and then the DI2, and the faster tyres, yeah. it all adds up, doesn't it? Yeah, but one, one caveat in the defence of, of the Le Monde bike has to be that in those days, they trained on those bikes, they trained in those positions, they were used to them. We're used to modern geometry on bikes, which allows for a much more open hip angle, and so consequently, when we switch on something that we're completely not used to, it, it feels really hard, I think. Yeah, it feels hard, but my power meter didn't lie. So yeah. I reckon, yeah. One thing, can I just say that, that did strike me as a run round, is Greg LeMond had never tried those bars before, basically prior to that time <laughs> trial. And he just rocked up on the final stage of the Tour de France and he rocked out a win. Hats off, Greg LeMond. Firstly, for being open-minded, and secondly, for being so adaptable. How cool is that? Apparently, according to Steve from Elmy Cycles, the bars were fitted that morning and they had to shim them with Coke cans to stop them slipping on his, on his handlebars. 
That is cool. Yeah. That is cool. Right, okay. So we still haven't got to the bottom of when a time trial bike is going to be faster than a road bike. So you know what's next? It's got to be the Lotus, hasn't it? It's got to be the Lotus. Fingers crossed it happens. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the Lotus. Is that a Lotus over there in the corner of the car park, Ollie? <laughs> Look at all the pros over there with all their fancy bikes and kit and they're, oh, we've got a big truck. Oh, and the 10 grand Italian super bikes, they think they're, they think they're so good. Hmm, the question is, what would happen if you swapped bikes with a Tour de France pro and made them ride a crap 250 quid bike from Amazon that weighs more than twice as much? Could you beat them on a climb? Well, with the help of Villiers and one of the best climbers in the world, we're gonna find out. It's time for pro rider on a shit bike versus shit rider on a pro bike. Climb edition. For this test, we're gonna need a pro. Fortunately, here's one that we made earlier. This is Joe Dombrowski. He rides for Team Astana, Kazakhstan. He's one of the best climbers in the world. He's won races at the highest level of the sport and has completed the Tour de France. Sorry, Joe, but I'm gonna have to take this off you. Um, okay. I've got your new bike over here. Enjoy. Thanks. <laughs> let, me have, let me show you this. You're in for a treat. All right. Once again, I will assume the role of our rider. Okay, okay, I'm not that crap, but I am an amateur. I'm quite fit for an amateur, but compared to a world tour pro like Joe, I am distinctly bang average. We next need a climb, and this is the Col de Rates in Valencia, Spain. It's 6.5 kilometers long with an average gradient of 5.2% and is arguably the most popular training climb in the world for professional cyclists, many of whom come here to train in the winter months. The average road cyclist would get up here in about 28 to 30 minutes. My time's quite good for an amateur. It's 17 minutes, 33 seconds. But Joe has an exceptional time. He's done it in 13 minutes, 33 seconds. Although that was on his fancy pants bike. <laughs> Speaking of which, this is the kind of bike that Joe normally rides. It's an absolutely stunning Villiers Triestina SLR Zero, an ultralight carbon fiber racing machine, which looks just beautiful in the 2023 uh, team colors for Team uh, Astana. I mean, this paint job with this like marbled effect on it and this blue fade, oh, it, I, this, is, I, I, this is the nicest like standard team issue pro bike paint job I've ever seen. A bike like this, it's just the best of the best. I mean, you've got Shimano Jura Ace Di2 electronic 12 speed gears. You've got these amazing super lightweight Corima carbon fiber wheels with, you know, just look at these spokes, carbon fiber as well, incredibly light, all integrated cables um, and a one piece bar and stem to make it all sleek and aerodynamic. Oh, it's incredible. This bike weighs just 6.8 kilograms. Hardly, I mean, lift it with one finger. The minimum weight allowed by the UCI, although in theory, you could make it lighter than that. The frame set is said to be less than 800 grams, which is very low, even for pro bike standards. But it also boasts very high stiffness to weight. The lateral stiffness of the frame is said to be 154 newton meters per kilogram versus 124 newton meters per kilogram on the previous 07. It's a climbing weapon. It's a stark contrast to the 250 pound bike, the bike that Joe is gonna be riding. So I think we should uh, introduce him to it. <laughs> I can't wait to ride this. This is amazing. Look at it. Oh, it's so nice. Ooh. Prior to giving Joe his new bike, we let the Team Astana mechanics set it up for him. They all thought it was great. Carbon? No. No. No carbon. <laughs> no carbon. No. <laughs> Bigger than that. <laughs> 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 
Oh, he's all carbonium. This is the bike you're going to be riding today. Are you excited? Let's new see it. New bike day, right? This is. I'll remove the sheet. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Amazon bike. All wow. 250 pounds of it. It's uh, yeah. It's got a kickstand. It does. I, uh, I think you should lift it. I think you should lift it. See what you think to the the weight of that. Oh, how, how does that compare? Yeah. Uh, I mean. That's 17 that's kilos. 17 kilos. Mm. That's more than double my uh, my race bike. Yeah. But you know what they say? A bad workman always blames their tools. Well, I guess we'll put that to the test. <laughs> <laughs> Does have a kickstand though, and uh, it's got aero wheels. They say carbon, but I'm not sure these are carbon. No, they say no carbon. <laughs> <laughs> This is, uh, yeah, it's it's something. This is like a question: Could Lewis Hamilton win on win in Monaco with a Fiat Panda? Right. Well, well. Ah. Yeah. The the mechanics have put your pedals on it and, and put your saddle height up. So, I see that. Yeah. So it should feel exactly like your normal bike. Oh yeah, that's. Uh, How's my position look? Aero. Good, no? Yeah. You look pro. It's not bad. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty bad, but... The, other, the guys were wondering what this bike was gonna be like. We mm. were speaking about it at the dinner last night. But they, they were thinking I would lose over a race bike, a maximum of three minutes. A maximum of three minutes? Yeah. That's quite interesting, because your best time on this climb... What is my best time on 13, this? 13.33. Really? I, I, I had a look on Strava. Okay. How my many best watts? Time, How many watts? 390. Okay. My best time, 17.33. Ooh. So... That's pretty quick. So, that's... That's close, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of, yeah. Oh, I have to find out. But, but they haven't seen this bike. I think three minutes might be a bit optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna see. Mm, we are. How long do you think you could survive in the peloton on this bike? In a stage in the Giro or Tour? Until the Giro. Until the neutral. <laughs> Ends. But then even sometimes if it's a nervous start, the neutral can be quite you could drop it even on the neutral. I think so. Dropped in the neutral. <laughs> Our challenge is simple. We'll set off together at the bottom of the climb and have a race. First one to the top wins. This is the bottom of the climb. Are you feeling good, Joe? I'm feeling good. Nice. Just, I mean, one thing, the last pro to ride that bike uh, was Rory Townsend. After riding it, he became national champion of Ireland. So, so we can expect big things. Yes, it's got magical powers, I'm certain of it. All right. Right, three, two, one, and go. Yeah. Right, three, two, one, let's go. Oh, wrong gear. I don't think Joe's expecting me to go that hard out of the blocks. I've managed to get a gap. Put him under pressure. It's gonna ease off the touch, settle in, get a good rhythm now. Whoa, I'm full gas already. <laughs> Five minutes in, oh, I'm worried I've gone too hard here. Uh, I've got a gap. Oh, I don't think this bike is too fast. I'm currently averaging over 330 watts, which is giving me a predicted time of under 18 minutes. And I can't see Joe in the background. So it's looking good.
I was into the last kilometre of the climb and I'd stretched out my lead to nearly a minute. Surely I had this in the bag. Then something unexpected happened. Oh, come on. What is it? There's like, why is there a traffic light? Oh, for God's sake. Oh, did you put this here? <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, it's like, I can't believe this is like, what, 500 metres from the finish? Oh, shit. I got a bit too hard early on, and then he's caught me up. Having lost my lead thanks to that pesky traffic light, we're now neck and neck coming into the final 500 metres. Joe kicked hard, and I was able to mark the attack, thanks in part to my significantly lighter bike, although I still had to peak at 868 watts. The finish line was still 100 metres away, and Joe kicked a second time, and I couldn't match it. This is one of the differences between an amateur and a top pro. He can recover and go again much quicker, made all the more impressive with how heavy that bike is. Including the temporary traffic light, which held us up 72 seconds, our time was 18.52. Comparing that to Joe's time of 13.33 on a pro bike, you're looking at around four minutes slower, which is mostly down to the added weight, but also slow rolling tyres, inefficient gears, and on a climb where we were averaging over 20 kilometres an hour, aerodynamics as well. So how, how bad was the bike? You know, from uh, the tires to the saddle to the i guess these are shifters it was really pretty bad yeah mine was absolutely mint and uh, yeah i've ridden that too it's completely pants so i guess this video shows that well lance armstrong was wrong it is all about the bike Indeed. unless there's like temporary traffic lights well involved. yeah yeah, well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, if you have, then uh, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends, if you've got any. And uh, big thanks to Joe. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Good race. And uh, also to Villier as well for making this um, video happen and letting us ride their absolutely beautiful bike. These paint jobs are incredible. Stunning, aren't? isn't it? Yeah. I'll see you later. Thanks. Is it the bike or the rider? In our latest quest to find out, I am putting myself, an ex-pro cyclist, on a Euro bike against an amateur, a weekend warrior riding a superbike. Who will come out victorious and does a superbike make all the difference? This is Simon Lewis, a keen cyclist who commutes to work twice a week. Weekends for Simon are spent trying out restaurants and local beers, and then when the sun is shining, well, you guessed it, Simon is riding. Simon has been cycling seriously for seven years. Races ridden, zero. Sportives, five. And an unknown fact about Simon, well, he was a professional dance player. Oh, nice throw, Simon. Now we know a little bit about our amateur rider, it's time to check out his bike, or should I say, super bike. This is what Simon is riding, the Canyon Air Road. It fits into the category of superbike. It's full carbon, full carbon wheels, full carbon frame. It's got aerodynamically optimized tubing. It's got electronic shifting. It's got integrated cabling, gears. Simon gets to ride 52.11. Price of this beauty, well, it costs the same amount as a small car. I, on the other hand, am riding this. Yes, the Eurobike. In all her glory, weighing in at over 15 kilograms, made from the heaviest material known to man, it looks aero. It's not. It's got the world's most uncomfortable saddle known to man. It's got shifting that I've never really used before. It's slow. The gears, yeah, get this, 1441 is the biggest gear. Costs, 
well around 239 pounds, 250 euros, dollars. I mean, it's a bargain. How fast is it? Hmm. Ah. We have touched down at GCN's test circuit in the beautiful quintessential and rather quiet Cotswold village of Acton Turville. Acton Turville is going to be lit up with a ferocious time trial. We're going to see a lot of pain faces, probably more from me than you, Simon. We'll see. <laughs> and talking of the bikes, do you look forward to riding yours? Yeah, I can't wait. It looks the part, doesn't it? And the uh, first time riding a super bike, first time riding electronic gears as well. So You're a lucky, exciting. lucky man. Well, I'm not quite looking forward to my Euro bike. Anyway, it's about time that we take a look at the course. Now, if you don't know it, it's 9.5 kilometers long. It's got a gradient change of pretty much zero. It's got two corners and one U-turn. Are you up for it? Can't wait. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's hit the start line. The race is simple. I'm going to start off first and I'm going to have a minute head start on Simon, who's going to start off second. You feeling confident, Simon? Minute. Hopefully I'll be able to catch you in that. I'm not looking forward to this. It's like red rag to a bull, isn't it? Something to chase. Right, you ready? The horizon. Yeah, let's do it. Count me in, buddy. Three, two, one, go! Gah! Slow start. Ugh, it's heavy. Like a flash. Three, two, one. One. Taking it gingerly on these wheels. Oh, railing it. Think, hang live and pretending a bit about how quick it will go. But. Get this sopping great lump of metal through. We're up to speed, 40k an hour. Got a tailwind on this first stretch, so I'm going to go too deep. But as you can tell from my breathing, still having to put a decent amount of effort in. Bike feels great though. Nice having electronic gears, very crisp. It's the hard bit for me. The weight of the bike. I bet Simon's able to put the power down the whole way around the circuit. And I'm just finding myself topping out. So I've got to make it up on the hills. But I'm also dragging a 15 plus kilo bike up here. Ah! 34 k is now up here. 250 watts. He's closing on me. Go on, Simon! I haven't gone long. I've run out of gears. I can't pedal. Look, just spinning out. That is so a savage. That is savage. Here's Simon. I just about held him off, but what's it going to be time? Come on, Simon. Dig in. Yes, mate. Woo! How did that feel? Tough. <laughs> <laughs> Racing's never easy. Now you don't have a kickstand, so you I can't don't do have that. To hold it. Look at that. Well done, mate. Savage. Nice, I never, How never got close to you, no. Whoa. Was it as hard as you thought? And then some. Whoa. <laughs> Good bike. I can taste blood. Yeah. Which shows that we've been trying hard, right? It's like when you've had a Guinness, but in a really bad way. Yeah. Whoa. Right, we're going to get our breath back and we're going to cut when we're slightly more recovered. How's that? Nice. nice work, my man. You did, you did <laughs> a smashing job. <laughs> Another one. race completed. A massive thank you to Simon Lewis for getting involved and bringing Acton Turville another great showdown. Right, Simon, how did it feel? The bike was super great. Bike. It was, yeah, I loved it. I mean, beautiful, crisp shifting. Yeah. For me, legs maybe not quite as crisp as the bike was, but hey, 
whatever. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we haven't seen the results yet. I've got to say, you wouldn't pay me to ride that again. It's just not fun. It's not an enjoyable experience. Well, I didn't get near you, so you're climbing <laughs> too bad. But <laughs> I mean, I was terrified of you catching me. Anyway, at that time, we check out the results. So, are you ready to show me your Wahoo, Simon Lewis? Let's do it. Well, I'll caveat out. I think it auto unpause itself, but yeah. I did take a little sneak peek because I went over the line, so I do have that. So what was your time for the entire route? It was 15.55. Oh, good. So I did it in 16.42. So luckily, I held you off. Yep. And just. <laughs> well, yeah, just, just held you off. Felt further away. What was your average speed? 37. So mine was 35.8. So you held a good average speed, faster than I. What was your max speed? Oh, 53.7. That's where you might have me beaten. Yeah, I, I got 56 oh. kilometers per hour. Oh, that, I'll put that down to the extra weight. Yeah. <laughs> now I've got to say, obviously, I'm not quite as quick as our resident pro, Roy Townsend, who did a time with Ollie of 14.24. Crucially, what about the power numbers? Unfortunately, a power meter doesn't really come as standard on the Eurobike like it does on the Air Road CFR. So I'm not sure what I was putting out. But Simon averaged a really impressive 257 watts. Now that's still a bit less than what I can typically manage. But I fear that in reality, the Eurobike has rather let me down. I mean, 57 seconds slower in spite of the 50 to 80 watts more power. Yep, I know, I know what you're gonna say. A bad workman blames their tools. Yeah, maybe I need to get training and request a rematch. I'm sure Simon would be keen for another go on the canyon. So there we have it. Simon Lewis and the Superbike did it 47 seconds faster than I on the Eurobike. But kind of give it a break. It's only 230 quid. Mm -hmm. And that's Amazing. thousands of pounds. Anyway, let us know in the comment section below if you want to see another showdown with the Eurobike with Simon. And what else should they do? Give a big thumbs up. And we'll see you in the next video. How much difference does spending money make to the performance of your bike? Well, we're going to find out in Cheap Bike versus Superbike. Ding, ding! Two bikes at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Firstly is this, Canyon's Aeroad. Lightweight, carbon fibre moulded into aerodynamic shapes, but not at the expense of comfort. And on board, we have Shimano's latest and greatest R9170 group set. And that means electronic shifting and hydraulic brakes. And also we have Shimano C40 wheels. So low weight and aero two. Yeah, and then we've got this, a rally, which we bought on eBay for 90 pounds. To be fair to it, it is actually an awful lot of bike for the money, but how much of a handicap is it gonna be? You know what, mate, I actually think it's all white. Apart from the bar tape, that's not white, but the rest of it's all white. Yeah, you're pretty much spot on there, sorry. Right, round number one. It's a simple one, this one, climbing men and machines against this, which is actually a particularly uncomfortable climb, just shy of two kilometers long, an average gradient of 11%, which I always think is weird, because most of it feels like it's above 20%. It's a tough one. Uh, shall I grab, I'll just grab that one for now. No, 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 I'm just, this is mine after all size, so I'm gonna have first dibs on this for the first ascent, if that's okay. Sorry, mate. Yeah, that's all right, I mean, no, fair enough, because yeah. you'll be tired then when you're riding no, no, this no, one. Just, and that one will feel where, better. Where okay, no, that's fine, mate. If you want to do it that way around, it's your call. Oh, and have we mentioned we're going flat out. Now, the major difference between these two bikes when climbing is their weight. The Superbike is a lean and mean 7.3 kilograms with a Wahoo element attached. Remarkable when you take into consideration that it's an aero bike with disc brakes. And a cheap bike is a rather weighty 11.95 kilograms, a difference of over 50%. All right. Right, so you go first. I'm going to give you a minute. Okay. But I'm not overly hopeful of catching you. you know what to do? Yeah. Right. Top. Wish me luck. Off we go. Look at that. Poetry in motion. Beep, 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 boop. In first time. Oh, Ah! Uh. 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 Uh.
hate that climb. I absolutely hate that climb. Uh, to be fair though, I do like this bike. That felt cool. And most importantly of all up there, big range of gears. I ended up using my lowest, which is 34 at the front and 30 at the back. So we'll see how it goes on the other one with racier gears. He loves it, doesn't he? He loves it. Well, that's my first proper hill climb for a long, long time, but I didn't even need to think about the bike. It worked a dream. It was just me that's a little bit lacking, but I certainly emptied the tank. Went a bit steady early on, and then when that steep bit pitched up, I just had to give it everything just to get up. Yeah, you can tell how hard I went, mate, because I've got a patch of snot on my leg warmer that I can't get off. Got a little bit on my sleeve as well. Yeah. British hill climbs, eh? Run number two then after a quick bike swap. As well as the weight, there was also the issue of the gears. Pedaling doesn't feel particularly different, it has to be said. Even cheaper gears are remarkably efficient. As a design, chains and sprockets are fantastic. Just as long as you keep them clean, which, as you know, I do mention from time to time. The gear range of the two bikes is broadly similar, even if our superbike has 22 and our cheap bike has 16. And although the Canyon is an out and out race bike, the new Shimano Dura Race has allowed us to fit an 11 to 30 cassette, which is just as well up here. Okay, run number two. I'm looking forward to this actually, weirdly enough. Superbike time for you, cheap bike for me. Go on, Sai, give it all you got, mate. I will do, mate. Uh, Off you go. Look at that. <laughs> Sweet as a nut. Yeah! Oh my goodness me, that feels good. Like, stiff, responsive. I'm intrigued to know the results, but purely based on perception, this is another world, I'm afraid. Here we go, cheap bike time. First time. Oh, well, here we go. Run number two. And the bike doesn't feel too much different. Feel the weight a bit. Position's a bit different. But even the cheaper gears are remarkably efficient. And as a design, the chain and the cogs, well, it's just great. Especially if you keep them clean, which not all of us presenters do. I hate to say it, but that was, that was like night and day. That was very different. Although less so on the steep bit, actually. The biggest difference was when getting out of the seat and accelerating, and I managed to stick it in the big ring over the top. Be interested to see the times. Well, to paraphrase three-time Tour de France champion Greg LeMond, it doesn't hurt any less, you just go faster. The question is, how much faster? And the answer is actually quite a lot, wasn't it? Nearly a minute for both Matt and myself, which corresponds to just about 10% time difference. Yeah, what about the feeling? Because that's pretty important too. Well, for me, Obviously, this bike, the Canyon, the Superbike, did feel far stiffer, far more responsive, and I must admit, I spent a lot more time out of the saddle. I felt the power was transmitted, transmitted far better. This bike, I felt a lot more comfortable sitting down and applying the power in a slightly different way. And it just felt generally a little bit more sluggish. Round number two, with the climbing out of the way for today, we've got a simple but very important test, braking. These Shimano hydraulic brakes are the absolute bomb when it comes to performance. They've got all the power you need, but with added modulation, meaning you can use that power to stop far quicker rather than skidding down the road. And the tyres, well, they're gold standard as well. Continental Competition 25mm tubeless. 
It's a pretty simple test, riding at 40 kilometers an hour downhill and then trying to stop as quickly as possible. Oof. The weight distribution there was impressive. Thanks, mate. That's all right, mate. Well, 5.4, uh, 5.4, so 5 meters 40, 5.40. So the mark has been laid down. How is our cheap bike going to fare? Well, on the positive side, the cables are super smooth, loads of life left in the pads, and I have spent time setting them up. However, you'll see if I squish on the lever, there's quite a lot of flex actually in the caliper itself, meaning that you're going to lose a bit of power and you're going to lose modulation. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that these pads are a really hard compound, meaning that they're going to last a super long time, but they're not actually going to slow us down very quickly. Still, I'm going to give it a good go. Ooh. Just keep that bike steady, please, Si. Sorry, Matt. Thanks, Sorry. Mate. 10, bang on, 10.5. 10.5? 10.5 metres. So we have 5.4 and 10.5. Oh. Yeah. So roughly stop, double the stopping distance. Wow, Si, the results are in. And I can tell you, there's nearly 100% difference in the stopping distances of the two bikes. I mean, let's be fair, the rally, it stopped you, so it's safe enough. Yeah, yeah. But the stopping power of the canyon is mightily impressive. Yeah, yeah, that, there was a significant difference. Admittedly, uh, this is quite a controlled test, so there's not that going to be that many occasions where you'd be doing an emergency stop in real life, or hopefully not anyway. But you've got to wonder, haven't you, that if that difference over the course of a whole ride, even just coming up to junctions and on descents and things, you'd have thought that would have quite a big effect, wouldn't you? Or will it? Challenge number three, descending. Now, armed with our braking knowledge, just how are these bikes going to stack up? Will the added confidence of better braking make us faster, Will the improved aerodynamics help as well? Yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Now, you know that we don't exactly have any alpine descents on our doorstep, but this one is pretty good. Three kilometres long, an average gradient of 5%. All right, stop laughing at the back. It's the best we've got, OK? Uh, we're not going to go flat out because it's open roads and we are, of course, getting old. But nevertheless, I think we should see how we get on. But significantly, I get to go on the superbike again. See in a bit, Si. <laughs> OK, superbike run downhill. Here we go. Oh no, not clipped in. <laughs> okay, here we go. Descent I know well on a bike I'm not very familiar with. Poor brakes. But let's give it a nudge. Twenty-five seconds. Twenty. I cannot believe that. Well, Literally. Let's have a little look at this bike, though. Aerodynamics have got to play a big part. Yeah. Okay, on that yeah. descent. There's no. This is, and it was a bit of a headwind down the descent, but. The disc brakes, so much power, they give me so much confidence going into those corners. I could brake relatively late compared to using normal caliper brakes, and even in these wet conditions as well. So, yeah, aerodynamics and these wonderfully powerful brakes, too. Yeah, I still can't believe 25 seconds. There it's were a couple a of points where I, I ran out of gears, so I just free wheeled. And yeah. I did pedal, I've got bigger gears than you. We need to add that into the mix as well. Yeah, yeah, you do. But I just, 25 seconds. I, think I was not expecting that, mate. I was there not expecting that. That's right. It's another brutally simple test. Ride 10 kilometres as fast as we possibly can. Now, so far, the differences between these two bikes have been significant, but not, I think, insurmountable. But I just have a hunch that maybe the superbike is going to land the killer blow on this one. Although, you've got a 1.5 watt saving on your element bolt there. That's yep, that's not to be sniffed at. Got pulled one and a half watts back. It could be closer than we think. Why do I have a hunch that this is going to be a big one then? Well, firstly, I've got to say it's because it's going to be the longest challenge, so the gaps are likely to be larger. But aerodynamics are incredibly important in cycling, much more so than bike weight, in almost all instances, in fact, except 
for really steep climbs. The rider admittedly makes up the largest component of total aerodynamic drag and I can actually get into a really good position on the cheap bike so that's not something you have to pay for at all. My clothing is also the same, super aero in fact, however the difference in the bike is still hugely significant. The shallow wheels and 32 spokes cause a lot of turbulence, the round tubes too punch a hole through the air and it doesn't smooth airflow around it at all. Beep. And then you missed a beep! That was only four, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Anyway, he's off. Okay, here we go. Beep, 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 beep. In first time again. I tell you what, hey man, Whew. you look like you went deep. <laughs> the funny thing about all of this is actually the thing that bothered me the most, let it out mate, Sorry. let it out. The thing that bothered me the most was I couldn't get the right gear because it's only eight speed. I know it sounds stupid, but I was either pedaling too slowly or too fast. And like, it's not a biggie, but it does weigh on your mind a little bit when you're going full gas. Yeah. There are I went pretty much flat out there, mate. That one, that, there's no, the bike. No one I didn't really, you, no, I didn't really have to think about the bike. The gear ratios were fine. Bottom of the block, just felt good. And it felt, I'm not particularly quick these days, but this bike is pretty quick and it felt like it was doing the job. So. Go on, mate, can I have a go, please? I'm desperate. <sighs> All right. If the cheap bike's shallow wheels and numerous spokes cause a stack of drag, what's the secret of the Shimano C40s? Well, there are fewer spokes, just 16 and 21 front and back, but the main reduction in drag stems from the rims. Deep sectioned and made out of carbon fibre to allow for this specific wind cheating shape. The rim is 28mm wide, so that there's minimal disturbance of air as it transitions from the tyre to the rim, and the shape of the rim itself is called toroidal. That means it's aerodynamic on both the so-called leading edge, but then also on the trailing edge, so as the air meets the second side of the wheel. You ready, mate? Go for it, mate. Okay. Boop, 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 boop. He's in again, first time. Time trial is horrible, isn't it? It is, isn't it? But. At least it was over quicker on this one. I don't actually know exactly what the time difference was, but just looking at the Wahoo, it looked like there was a, between about three and five kilometers per hour difference at all times, which yeah. is massive, isn't it? Let's yeah. face it. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't have a problem with the gears. I just tended to just hoop a big one around, around, around that dodgy corner. That was, uh, it just took me a while to get this one going from the turn yeah. and from out of those bends we had to slow down. That's a little bit sluggish, but once you got dialed into position, it was as quick as it could go, but Clearly not as beautifully sculpted and shaped as, as the canyon, but... I thought you were going to talk about my legs then. Oh no, they are pretty beautifully sculpted. Yeah, thanks. But no, a pretty good workhorse, this. It is, yeah. I mean, you, like, I don't know about you, but, you know, I think my average is about 40 kilometres per hour. That's still pretty respectable, a 90 pound bike. Yep. Well, that's turned into quite a tough day, isn't it? it certainly has. Right. Results then. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, we've just seen a clean sweep of victories for our superbike. It climbed faster, it braked faster, it descended faster, and it time trialed faster. Which, though, do you think was the biggest area of improvement in percentage terms? It was actually the braking. So in just a handful of seconds, in just a few short meters, the Shimano hydraulic disc brakes outperformed the regular caliper brakes by a rather whopping 100%. That's not just a significant increase in percentage, but from a performance perspective, that could actually save your life, or at least get you out of a very difficult situation out on the road. Now, do you need to spend loads of money there to get great braking performance? I don't think you do. In fact, I strongly suspect that a bike with Shimano Sora calipers on would close the gap to those Durace hydraulic discs quite significantly. So actually, if you do have cheaper calipers, then spending a little bit to replace them could well be a really, really intelligent upgrade. Hmm, absolutely. So, Si, what is next? 
aerodynamics. Well, both descending and time trial, the performances were pretty illuminating, but for me, the descending did catch me a little bit by surprise. Yeah, there was a 15% difference on average between the superbike and the cheap bike. Now, on the descent, of course, as we've just seen, the brakes will have been responsible for a chunk of that time, but undoubtedly aerodynamics have an effect, and certainly in the time trial they did. The bad news, I'm afraid, though, is that aero wheels and aero frames don't come cheap. So in this instance, the cheap bike was at a really distinct disadvantage. Although in its defence, if it's speed that you're craving on that bike, don't do TTs. No, exactly. If you want to race, then race bunch events instead, like a road race. Because if you've got some shrewd tactics and some strong legs, then the disadvantage of riding an unaerodynamic bike will be lessened really significantly when you're riding in a peloton. So work on your body position, maybe even tailor your cycling kit if need be, and you will be able to fly. So what about the climbing then? So on that short, rather brutally steep climb that we did our tests on, the difference between the two bikes was around 10%. So it just shows that over four and a half kilograms makes a massive difference. Yeah, it does. And it's also worth saying, isn't it? that those two bikes felt like completely different animals, like chalk and cheese. And so you can really see why people get obsessed about bike weight. If you like steep climbs, it does make a difference. You know what, mate? If I'm being completely honest, I genuinely was hoping that the difference between these two bikes wasn't going to be quite so significant. But the fact is, the super bike is in a different league. It, it's just faster, period. True. So what should we look at next then? Well, how much do you think it's going to cost to start to really narrow that gap? 500 euros? 1,000 dollars? 2,000 pounds? Yeah. Before we do get onto that though, I think there is one last important point that we should address, and that is that our cheap bike is still a great little bike, isn't it? It ticks two fundamental points. Firstly, it's safe to ride, and secondly, being a road bike, it's just great fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to ride. So you shouldn't get disheartened about this at all. If you do have a cheaper entry-level bike, it shouldn't always be about the bike. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We are all part of the same tribe, no matter what we ride. So on that note, do make sure you subscribe to GCN. We're all part of the same tribe. To do so, just click on the globe. It's completely free. Now for another sort of sciencey video about how important weight is, how about clicking just down here where me and Dan did that very test in Andorra. Yeah, wearing your fat rucksacks. It was fat rucksacks. Yeah. Or to see a little bit more about Matt's superbike and in particular his Shimano Durace 9170 group set, click just down there. And don't forget to like and share. Every time a new bike is released, we get told how much stiffer, lighter, and more aero it is. To the extent that some people have become almost immune to the incredible progress that's been made. So what happens when we compare the very latest superbike to a very traditional bike? From climbing all the way to the all-important cafe stop cool factor. It's retro versus modern, yes, but it's also steel versus carbon. And is it speed versus style? two bikes back to back, it is incredible. Barley Bridgewood. Hello. Hey, Ollie, how's it going mate? So, um, so we're Leah, as you know, one of the world's oldest bike brands, have Basically, asked us to go for a bike ride and make a video about essentially the coolest bike they make. Yes, I, I have heard of, of Villia. Well, yeah, I figured. But if you want to just meet me in the usual place tomorrow morning, we'll go for a pedal. Yeah, sounds awesome. All right, I'll see you in the morning. Nice. See you then. This is the Villia Filante. It is an Italian thoroughbred superbike, pure performance, a bike designed to help the world's best bike riders win the world's biggest bike races. Over a hundred years of experience has been poured into this bike, which is both aerodynamically optimized and also seriously light, just seven kilos. All right, all right? All right. What is that? 
This is the coolest bike that Villier makes, just like you said. Well, I'm not entirely sure that's what I meant. I mean, that is clearly the cooler bike. Well, fortunately, Si, cool is subjective, as uh, well, anyone that's seen your haircut would agree. Well, that is a fair point. But no, I mean, that, that can't be as cool as that because it's going to be nowhere near as fast, is it? Cool isn't just about being as fast as you can be, Si. Cycling's about much more than that. Life isn't always a competition. God. The Falante is a modern Italian superbike, but so is this. The Superleggera pays homage to the history and heritage of the brand. It's handmade in Italy using the same materials and techniques as what they used in the 1970s. In fact, the only real change has been to replace some of the less environmentally friendly manufacturing processes. And the Superleggera is made from Columbus steel and has a lugged construction. The fork it actually uses the same tooling as what they used way back when in the olden days. It's every bit the retro bike, except it's not, because retro bikes, in my experience, are, are quite rubbish and rickety and in danger of falling apart. But this one has full modern components on it in the form of Campagnolo's latest 12-speed group set. I mean, Italian bike, Italian group set. Oh. And the fact that it's modern means that it's reliable, which means we can go on a ride and genuinely compare the two bikes without fear of this one falling to bits. It's amazing to think that bikes like this with a blueprint for all bikes for like 30, 40 years. And that, you know, it wasn't until, well, kind of the, the 1980s when they went mad for tech and more exotic materials like titanium, aluminium and carbon came along that things started to change. Yeah, and when they did change, they changed so rapidly as well. I mean, the things that us cyclists have seen over the last 30, 20, even five years has been incredible. Like, it's been nothing short of a revolution, like an arms race for brands. Yeah, and you know, when you look at bikes like that, it, the biggest things that have come along it, is carbon fiber, and our increased knowledge of aerodynamics, and together those things have just been a complete game changer. They have, yeah. Now how much they've changed the game, we are about to find out, because we need to earn our pastries, don't we? So we're gonna do the first of our performance tests climbing, just to see how much difference there is between cutting edge and classic. So basically a competition, even though we said that life isn't a competition. Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, we're not competing, the bikes are competing, but, but yeah. I couldn't help myself, mate, I'm really sorry. Should we do it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This climb is four kilometers long at an average gradient of 5%. Now that's not super steep by any stretch, but how much difference will we see? How much of an advantage do modern cyclists have now? Okay, Ollie, you ready for this? Oh, I suppose. Right, let's do it. Oh, It's a pointless experiment. Of course Sai's going to win. His bike's way lighter than this one. But what I'm going to focus on is just looking cool. Because that's what this bike is all about. I'm not bothered about winning. Just, I'm just going to style it out. Bit of Marco Pantani style climbing in the drops. Yeah. We'll be honest here, we really wanted to see just how each other's bike felt to ride as well. So we did a run on each. You know, bowling along in the saddle feels absolutely fine, but as soon as you get out the seat and kind of press on the pedals, it's just, it doesn't respond as quickly. It feels like, it feels like you're kind of dragging it behind you rather than it surging in front. It's amazing how much stiffer and lighter this bike feels. It really is night and day. And I'm not just saying that because Sai beat me. <laughs> it really is.
And the results were pretty clear cut. I was 24 seconds slower when I rode the classic compared to the Falante, and Ollie was 28 seconds slower. That's roughly a 4% difference. Is it scientific? No. Is it interesting? Well, we think so. People, if you're watching this thinking we're gonna just be saying this, but it, it just, it genuinely feels more efficient than, 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 than an old school bike. And it, it, it's, I, I, yeah. I, but it's more than that though. Like, you know, you can talk about performance, you can quantify it, but it feels more alive, doesn't it? Like, you, you, you know, that bike gives you more back than this one. People, not many people are gonna get the opportunity to ride bikes like this back to back like we just have, but it, it really is night and day. I'm gonna ask you again then. Which bike is the cooler bike? That one, still. <laughs> still a cooler bike, it's a cooler bike. That was quite a big difference uh, between the two bikes. Yeah. But uh, why? Well, there are three main ways in which modern bikes have improved. Firstly, you have aerodynamics. Secondly, you have stiffness. And thirdly, you have a massive decrease in weight. There's almost two kilos of difference between these two bikes. And most of it is in the frame and the forks. Yeah, and well, impressively, that Filante frame only weighs 870 grams, which for an aero bike is very light. Yeah. And the other thing is, that we were traveling at over 20 kilometers an hour on that climb, at which point aerodynamics does become significant, which is one of the main reasons probably why you beat me. A bit more on that later. That's right. In contrast though, the Columbus SL steel tubes on that Superledra have been created to be as light as possible, just given steel's particular characteristics of, of strength and, and toughness. And actually that SL tubing, whilst it's been around since the 70s, at that point, it was one of the premium steel alloys used in a whole host of the winningest race bikes of the time. Oh, yeah, that's all well and good sci-fi, all of that, mate. But let me rephrase it another way. What is cooler? The visceral rumble and roar, the pops and bangs of a naturally aspirated V8 in a Ford Mustang from 1969? or a Tesla. Case closed. Well, I, no, the case is not closed. Firstly, because the Tesla can do 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds, which is the same as a Bugatti Veyron. And secondly, this has nothing in common with a Tesla. This has got everything in common with the Bugatti Veyron. For a start, a Tesla couldn't get round a major bike race like a Classic, because it would literally run out of batteries. This bike, no such problem. And whilst we're on the topic of bike racing, I think it's about time we had another performance test, Ollie. Sprinting. Another competition. Yes, yeah, loser buys the coffees at the cap stop. Well, all right, whatever. But what on earth are we doing a sprint for? I mean, Si, our sprinting is almost as bad as our arm wrestling. Well, that is a fair point, my weedy friend. But no, sprinting gives us the perfect opportunity to dive into the topic of frame stiffness. Oh yes. Come on, then, mate. All right, Ollie. We're racing from the bottom of this little ramp to the top. Okay. You ready? We're not at the bottom yet. Three, two, one, go. Oh, oh. Yeah. Eight. What was that? I think you're just trying harder than me. Jokes and rubbish sprinting aside, let's talk about frame stiffness, shall we? It can mean many things when it comes to a bike, but typically it refers to how much the frame deforms underneath you as you use it. Uh, typically you could feel it moving when you're pedaling or when you're pulling really hard on the handlebars, but it can also refer to how much a frame can absorb 
the bumps and shocks coming up from the road through to your backside. Now ideally you'd want a frame that's laterally stiff for pedaling efficiency but vertically compliant to protect said backside from those shocks and vibrations. And the general consensus is that steel frames are more flexible but comfortable whereas carbon frames are stiffer and if you lay up the carbon fibres in a particular way. You can actually engineer compliance into a carbon frame and make it comfortable as well as stiff. Yes, the question is how much difference does it make out on the road? Now, the consensus is that a stiffer bike is a more efficient bike, but most people struggle to explain why that's the case. The best example that we've heard suggests that as a frame flexes, the wheels track in ever so slightly a different direction, which means that your rolling resistance increases significantly because instead of the tires rolling straight across the tarmac, they're kind of scrubbing inefficiently as you go. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because that's I think that's definitely what just happened with me just then. Well, yeah, you could almost see it, almost, as you were riding up there. Yeah. Yeah. And just think, if you've got a more powerful sprinter... Even more powerful yeah, sprinter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they might even have to ride a bike like this in a completely different way. Yeah, I mean, we can only imagine, can't we? Now, while sprinting is an extreme example, not one that many of us ever do, in mine and Ollie's case, for very good reason, stiffness is something that you can feel at lower powers as well, like even when just climbing out of the saddle. So it's why brands like Willier still concentrate on it. It's why this Volante, for example, boasts a 12.5% increase in stiffness to weight ratio. Right, go the calf. I think we should go to the calf now, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. right. Remind me who's, who's buying the coffees? Uh, uh, very funny, very funny. <laughs> I feel like I should buy them just out of sympathy, to be honest with you, but anyway. I'll tell you what though, in spite of all your performance chat, the thing that everyone wants to know is which is the more stylish? Which is sexier? The traditional steel frame or the uh, modern superbike? Well, I do have to say the Falante has some serious competition today because that, that Romato colour scheme on the Superleggera is utterly gorgeous, isn't it? It's, it's another kind of sort of throwback to the heritage of Willia. That's like the iconic paint scheme from yesteryear. The steel is polished, then copper plated, and then polished again. And, um, well, it is quite nice. No. Yes. <laughs> My turn for a challenge now, and we're going to do a scientific experiment to work out which is the cooler and sexier bike. The way we're going to do this is have both bikes propped up outside the calf. And then my thinking is the one that you know, generates the most admiring glances, either looking left or right as people walk into the calf, is definitely the one that is the sexier, cooler bike. And to make it a fair test, we're not allowed to uh, drape ourselves over the top tubes of the bikes in a kind of alluring way in order to generate you know, more admiring glances. Size against the rules, so we're not going to do that. Really? Yeah, stop, stop, yeah. stop looking sexy. Trying to look sexy. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Myself and Sai sat in wait at the cafe, eagerly awaiting passers-by who would ogle our beautiful bikes. However, there was a problem. There's not that many people about, are there? You think the global pandemic, nationwide lockdown, and the fact that that cafe is technically shut has sort of put people off a little bit? Well, I, I mean, normally this place is absolutely rammed. I think yeah, COVID restrictions might have made it a bit more desolate. So, a bit, but yeah. the principle still stands. I think the experiment was, can still work, even with fewer people. Let's just Here's wait. someone. Oh, no. No, no, it's uh, not. Ollie, this is stupid. There is no one here. Should we just say the Philante's one and we crack on? No chance. No, we're not doing that. I've got a plan B. Let's take a picture of both our bikes, we'll put them on the GCN app and see who gets the most super nices. Sounds like a good idea. Right, well, let's go finish the ride and then we'll see who's the winner at the end. Well, right, let's crack on. Let's do it, mate. Back to performance whilst I rack up a gazillion super nices. Okay, 
on to our final performance test, right? We've seen just how much separates these two bikes when climbing, but how much of that was weight and how much was aerodynamics? To find out, we're gonna do a flat time trial. This is right up your street, Ollie. No complaining. <laughs> well, while we're on route, I think we should talk about our perceptions of stiffness. I think a lot of people watching this will be interested in that. And as someone who rides a lot of top end, very stiff carbon bikes, I feel that I'm getting more vibration on a sort of imperfect road surface like this than I would do on a modern carbon bike. Really? Yeah. That is controversial, I mean. <laughs> but it is interesting, right? Because I was, I was emailing the guys at Willier trying to get a bit more information about that super ledger and finding out just how close it is to those bikes from the 70s. And we got on to the topic of, of geometry and comfort and they said that actually that has changed slightly in that the older bikes were much more relaxed in terms of their geometry and also more flexible. And they said that simply because the road surfaces back then were just not as good. So a traditional bike from the 70s and 80s has actually got more in common with like what we'd call an endurance road bike of today. I stopped short of saying that it was a gravel bike because clearly it wasn't. For a start, it had tiny tire clearance because everyone rode really minuscule narrow tires no matter what surface they're riding on. Right, we're nearly there, Ollie. You ready? Oh, go on. Rip. Okay. Come on, mate. All right, let's do it. Sometimes it's just, it's just cracking good fun going as fast as you can. I know I'm overly competitive, but actually, even when there's no one to compete against, not even myself, just fast bikes are fun. There's no two ways about it. Sai is the most competitive man in the world. And although I can pretend that I, I'm not that bothered about racing, I, um, I do actually secretly want, want to do quite well. And even though I know that the skinny round tubes on the Super Legere aren't as aerodynamic as the, the aero wider ones on the Falante, I'm still quite intrigued to see what the difference is. And uh, I still try and ride as hard as I can. Plus, if I do lose, it's not down to me. It's down to the, uh, the non-aero round tubes, which is perfect. I mean, this bike has inbuilt excuses. Brilliant, I love this bike, it's amazing. <laughs> so, let's go. All right, three, two, one, let's go. On this short time trial, the difference was every bit as significant as on the climb. Ollie was 16 seconds faster over eight kilometers on the Falante, and I was 20 seconds faster. Once again then, the results are pretty stark, even on quite a short test, really. Ollie, could you explain, as our residence aerodynamics guru, why a bike that's so narrow and skinny actually is less efficient, less aerodynamic than a bike that kind of looks like it's got more air to push out of the way. Yeah, well, I wouldn't use the word guru, but uh, I, mean, I guess I'm the best we have. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll try. And basically, I've said it before, if you open an aerodynamics textbook and you look at how airflow behaves over different shaped objects, one of the first things you'll see is that cylinders are very inefficient. They create a relatively large wake behind them and a large wake equates to more drag, and that drag basically sucks the object backwards as it's trying to move forwards. And, you know, even around a, a cylinder like this that's much smaller in diameter, 
creates a much bigger wake than an aerofoil that is wider, as we see on the Philante. And taking it a step further, the aerofoils on the Philante, as kind of like a next generation aero bike, have been tweaked yet again to perform better in a cycling application. So the engineers have actually rounded the rear trailing edge of those aerofoils to make them better perform at higher yaw angles, which basically translates to crosswinds that you experience out in the real world. So this is a bike that's designed to be fast in the real world, not just a wind tunnel. And that's basically why you beat me. Yeah, it's pretty interesting that, isn't it? And you do sound like you know what you're talking about, Ollie. I, I'd call you a guru. Right, uh, now we have one last thing that we need to finish here, don't we? Which of these two bikes? This one is the cooler bike. Is the cooler bike? Yeah, 100%. Okay, honestly, you can drop the pretense now. We've put it done, in, we've put done it in the, the video. GCN app. 72% super nice, boom. Well, that is a good number of super nices, but it's not as much as this. What? 79% super nice from the Philante. Oh. And rightly so as well. I mean, that is a beautiful bike and it is a very cool bike. It's a very stylish wrong. bike. Right, we're having a pole. Forget yeah, this, just they're look wrong. At it. That, was, that, that didn't work, we're having a pole. Look how I'm glinting. Click down below, you can vote now. Which is the cooler bike? The Ramato Superleggera or the Philante. Or the really fast, light, efficient, comfortable, and drop dead gorgeous Philante. Right. Yeah, we will leave the final decision with you. If you have enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And uh, well, I suppose we've just got the, the tough task of riding home in the sunshine. Ollie. Yeah, on the coolest bike. Bye. Uh, we are both happy, aren't we? Actually, I guess, yeah. which is good. Yeah, that is. I've probably just got a ride on the front though. Previously on GCN, GCN presenters raced Andrew Feather up Cheddar Gorge in a relay race and lost. But this time, they are going to win. Oh, Connor's going. Big attack for Connor. Go on, Connor. Go, go, go. Got to jump on them. I don't know how much longer I can hold it. Pro hill climbers, bike, weight, equipment, performance obsessed. And Andrew Feather, British hill climb national champion, is no different. Yeah, and he's used to riding a bike that's been customised and tinkered with to within an inch of its life. It's an incredibly lightweight and stiff machine. And this is the bike that he's used to riding. Regular viewers of the channel will have seen it before, but it's a beautiful Super 6 high mod frame. And on it are the lightest components available to humanity. You've got this Schmolker saddle, looks like a torture device, Schmolker finishing kit, no bar tape, uh, and some very light hunt wheels, SRAM ETAP, EE brakes. I mean, it all in, five and a half kilos. It's a beast. I mean, Ollie, it's a beautiful bike, a rapid bike, but Andrew, I forgot to tell you actually, you didn't, you didn't need to bring it. Um, I mean, thanks for joining us on this challenge and all. Uh, we've got equipment for you, you know? Yeah, we've got to see the bike, but we've got a, a, you know, a specimen of a bike here. Wow. The Euro bike. There you go. Yeah, it's got a kickstand. Yep. 256 pounds sterling. Oh. Yes. 21 gears. And carbon number one wheels. Yeah, carbon number one wheels. Not sure they're carbon. No, they're steel. I think they're steel. Okay. Yeah. 15.6 kilograms. It's got disc brakes though. Mm. Almost three times as heavy then, basically. Yeah. yeah. And but we have a little race. Yeah, because we've yeah. established that on your bike, you always beat us. So we need to kind of level the playing field. So what do you reckon? Do you reckon you can beat us on the Eurobike? <sighs> let's, let's give it a go. Well, anyway, what do you guys think? Let's get voting on the GTN app. We've got a poll going. Do you think Andrew Feather is going to beat any of us in a race up Cheddar Gorge? on the Eurobike, 15.6 kilograms, remember? Yes or no, get a vote in now. Right, to the start. Start line. Not leaving anything to chance this time, we thought we'd get a DS to run Team GCN and make sure we had winning tactics and motivation. Pathetic, what, that's no excuse, Alex. We've been working on this for weeks and you turn up saying you've got tired legs. I've tried. That is no excuse, oh, Alex. Mate, what is going I, I, on I'm here? I'm sorry. You, you've pretty much let the team down already. She's gone into full DS mode again, mate. Like when it was five versus one. Five versus one staff, we better, we better go. You two f***ing get out of here! 
here now? What Sir, are you chatting about? Slow down, Om. Stand there. Get in line. I think it's your fault. You, you... Yeah, guys, I'm sorry. I do think this is my fault. Right, if you, if you guys keep messing about, you're not going to win this race, right? We need to have a team talk. We need to work out how we're going to tackle this. And I don't want any excuses because I've had enough. Ollie, right. If you get dropped in this, I, I honestly, I have no words, okay? Alex, I've seen how many snacks of the weeks you've been eating. To be fair, I haven't eaten too many snacks. Wait, stop sending, I need to tell them to stop sending snacks in. And Connor, the amount of ice creams you and Jesse have been eating, outrageous. You ride about, about oh, a like, mile. Oh, another ice cream. What about the strawberry? No, no. Right, get to the start line now. Come on. Come on. God, she, means, she really means it. Last time. time this happened, she made me do 30 hours. Don't talk to hours. me behind my back. The time has come. The scene is set and a thrilling race is upon us. Will our pro prevail? Or will bike choice and equipment prove his undoing? Will our brave GCM presenters come out on top, finally, with the odds and carbon fiber in their favor? Will Manon keep our team intact? Or will Ali just get dropped? The race is on. Winner is the first one to the top. Are we ready? Yeah. In three. Two, one, go! Oh, oh dear. Come on! Oh, look at him go! Right, and we're off. They're all still together. Connor's at the back. Come on, Connor, stay with it. If any of these let me down, I'm going to be heartbroken. All still together, Feather looks on fire, out the saddle. He's looking good, even though he's on a 15 kilo bike. Oh, Connor's going, big attack for Connor. Go on, Connor, go, go, go! Go on, Connor. Go on, Connor. Wasn't expecting that from Connor, but fair old move. He's got a big advantage now. The rest of them are sitting in. Go on, Connor. Got to jump on them. I don't know how much longer I can hold it. Come on, Connor, keep going. Alex and Ollie sitting in. This is good. This is good tactics from the lads. Connor's gone up the road, leaving Feather to do all the work with Alex and Ollie sitting on the wheel. Hopefully, Alex and Ollie can get a breather now and then hit him again if Connor comes back. Oh, he's still there. Alex is going, Alex is going over the top. Go on. <laughs> right, two of the GCN lads up, up front. Connor and Alex. Ollie staying back, sitting on Feather's wheel. This is good going. He's got a 15 kilo bike. You cannot get dropped, Ollie. Do not get dropped. Is Ollie gonna go for the attack? I think Ollie might go for an attack. Ollie's going for the attack. Straight over the top of Andrew. And he's going, ooh. He's actually got an all right sprint on him. begin with and then it scares them a bit so they physically cannot lose that's my tactic here just scare them they've they've actually won a race right 
fair, fair play, that's that was uh, quite a, quite a good effort. <laughs> I still thanks, coughing. Uh, thanks, DS Manon. But but you didn't really win, did you? What, what do you mean? We won. won. Connor won. Yeah, well, champions. Well, no, champions. You, all your bikes put together is what thirty grand. That. Just right. Two hundred fifty pounds. You do raise a very good point. Fifteen kilos. Yeah. So you didn't really win, did you? It wasn't a fair game, was it? Yeah. Well, to be fair. Uh, no, Ollie. You don't Andrew's... want any excuses. Oh. Well, Andrew, no, uh, there's no. no power meter on, on the Euro bike, but we do know that Andrew can do about 450 watts on this climb for why, eight why, minutes. Why, why can't you do that? Well, to, in fairness, I did about 400. I'm just not well, good enough. We're not a super talent, yeah. man. How did that actually compare to last time we all raced up here? It was, it was quite different because um, the last time, the first time, obviously I was able to follow your attacks a bit more, but there, yeah. I just really couldn't. Every time you attacked, I knew that I didn't have the acceleration on this bike, so I kind of rode to my own own effort, I suppose, at the end, but it was Well, hard. it's often said a bad, a bad workman blames his tools. Would you say you're going to blame the bike? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe second time around, the, uh, the legs are starting to tire, I don't know. Um, it was an incredible effort, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's, it's good fun. Perfect. Good you, you did, your tactics were quite good, though. I, I was quite pleased about that. Ollie, oh, great yeah. work, sitting on the Ollie, front. Ollie, great job at the And then Connor, Connor, I did think you were going to get dropped. wasn't going to lie. You just <laughs> swing it on the back and then you'd hit it. Oh, so it's a killer instinct, you know, man. Yeah. I did think if we lost to Andrew, we'd never see the end of this. So <laughs> no. it was mostly fear. Yeah, and we would have lost all of our sponsors <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, so. you'd have done a so, lot I mean, of damage. Well, was, technically, you won for the Global Cycle Network, and I will take that victory, whether anyone thinks it's real or not. Yes, yeah. uh, if you agree, please give this video a thumbs up. Please give it a thumbs up, even if you disagree. And uh, if you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one. See you later. All right, it's pub. Fun. Yeah, try and get Andrew <laughs> down the hill first. Yeah. No, he's stopping him on that. Carbon number one might have some issues. In 2018, GCN made a hyperbike. A bike that ripped up the rule book and then burned it. But after that video, a key question remained. Is a hyperbike actually any good? Honestly, we didn't know. So we've gone and built another one. Only this time we're armed with power meters so we can make our tests even more scientific. Our hyperbike is the Ventum One, a bike that when it was launched back in 2016, it was reputedly 24% faster in the wind tunnel than its next closest competition. It's a bike designed purely with the needs of triathletes in mind, right down to onboard storage. It's a bike that will make cycling's crusty old men in blazers choke on their cucumber sandwiches at the mere sight of it. Ventum has kindly supplied us with this to compare it to. Now, armed with their knowledge of aerodynamics, carbon engineering, and the expertise gained from developing the rule-breaking Maverick, the One, they decided to turn their attention to building a road bike. And this, the NS1, is the result. It's a bike that takes aim at the holy trinity of aerodynamics, lightweight, and versatility. A true superbike. Yeah, but how will these two very different beasts stack up? We are going to find out by pitting this top of the range one against that top of the range NS1, head to head. Yeah. Just, just one little uh, uh, note though, Sai. Yeah. Um, Ventum said that we could change anything we, we like on the bikes, just uh, not, uh, we can't change the triathlon bars on the one to uh, drop bars. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Before we get started, we need to deal with some dictionary definitions. I mean, what is a hyperbike and what is a superbike? Well, to our mind, a superbike is in the absolute top tier of bikes that money can buy. The world's finest components will adorn a frame set that's been crafted to be as good as it possibly can be, irrespective of budget. But it has to conform to the UCI rules, that set of regulations that's laid down by cycling's international governing body that means, should you wish, you can pin a number on and race it. 
be that in a local road race or the Tour de France. Uh, regulations that have actually governed road bike design since the Lugano Charter of the uh, mid-90s. A hyperbike, though, is one that's gone to another level. It doesn't care about rules, so it can be super light or, as in this case, ultra aero. Dan, a little bit of added bling wouldn't hurt either. Well, for a start, the absence of seat stays contravenes rule 1.3020, as does the oversized top tube. That won't fit into the guidelines, also stipulated by 1.3020, uh, 0.2 figure one, and nor does the complete lack of any down tube. There you are. Finally, well, the fairings on the brakes, they're just a flagrant disregard for rule 1.3.0. Seriously, what is with that guy? Si, just out of interest, why do you seem to think that all triathletes have blonde mullets, moustaches and a fondness for baby oil? Well, don't they? Well, I guess some of them might. Yeah, exactly. Also, this is significantly better than the alternative. Well, what was that? You don't want to know. What are our tests going to be today? Well, we've come to GCN's semi-official test track, which consists of a horrible climb that's a mile of impossibly steep tarmac, a twisty, slippery descent with hazards in the form of wild sheep, and then a pan-flat out-and-back time trial. Three short tests within a matter of minutes will give us a snapshot of a bike's ability a radar diagram of performance. Climbing, which is generally a product of the weight. Descending, is largely governed by the handling, the brakes, and the stiffness of a bike. And then straight line speed, which is mostly aerodynamics. As Ollie mentioned at the beginning, the difference between this video and previous comparison videos is that these bikes have power meters. Now, Ventum recognized the importance of solid data and though they supplied them with Pioneer power meters already fitted, although they are actually an option that you can choose if you're buying from the Ventum website. One option among many, in fact, like your group set, your crank length, cassette size, handlebar width, etc. etc. Now, what it means is that we will be able to ride to a set average power and therefore any difference in times will be as a direct result of the bikes. Or, or any number of environmental factors, such as the variation in wind speed, uh, air density, or the aerodynamic turbulence created by mullets and moustaches. Run one, Sai's going to ride up the hill first on the Ventum 1 hyperbike. Yes. Beep, 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 beep. Because this bike is built specifically to optimise aerodynamics, it does mean that the frame set weighs more than on the NS1, which is not surprising that the NS1 is something of a featherweight, but also because there is a lot of carbon fibre in this giant beam. And that's to make sure that the bike is nice and stiff, even though you've got rid of that down tube, which would otherwise act as a nice brace forming a triangle and obviously the same is true at the rear end as well but how much carbon is in this machine certainly seems to be doing its job because you can't actually tell that bits of this bike are otherwise missing unlike my moustache run one on the super bike oh.
run number one, average power, 408. Oh, down to the bottom for a quick outfit change. It's not quite so much pain when you've got a power meter on. They look remarkably controlled. You really need to maybe shake things up a bit. It's pretty hard. It's pretty steep in the middle, but I'm not looking forward to doing it on that now. <laughs> <sighs> Here you go, mate. The tash is just on the floor, somewhere about 400 meters that way. Right, run number two, super bike. Can you give me some bleeps? Beep. Beep, beep, beep. I can tell, even though that's just a bleep, that he wasn't happy doing that. Beep, beep, beep. Still not trying anywhere near hard enough for this climb. Well, I've got the times on my Wahoo, and just then, 10.10, I did it in. On the one? On the one, and I did a power of 354 watts. On that one, I was 20 seconds quicker, so I did 950. Um, but the power was about the same, so I'm quite pleased with myself. I did uh, 352 watts, so. Nice. Well, yeah. interestingly, so uh, I was 17 seconds faster on this one. Well, I can't claim to be quite so consistent on this one. The power was a little bit more on the NS1, so seven watts more, but it was still <coughs> 17 seconds faster, this one, compared to the one. Unsurprising, perhaps, that the NS1 has, has dominated this test because it is 1.3 kilos lighter than the one, isn't it? So, uh, so yeah, a featherweight next to an out-and-out -out time trial rig, but... Uh, yeah, there we go. Number one, NS1 has it. Well, our triathlon bike is carrying a little bit of extra weight as a result of its exotic aero design. The fact is this NS1 is really pretty light on its own merit. And part of that is down to an exotic material used in its construction. It's only the second bike to have ever come our way that has graphene added to it. Now, that's not a simple compound to explain in the context of carbon composites, at least not quickly anyway, but essentially a very small amount of graphene is added to the resin that then bonds our carbon fibers together. And although it's a small amount, it actually has a disproportionately large effect on the overall strength and stiffness of the material, meaning you can actually use less material in your finished product, which is why this air aero disc frame weighs a little over 800 grams and yet still has that lateral rigidity that you need in order to get a fast feeling responsive bike. Onto the descent. Although there is a problem here, we probably don't need to point out that you can't really race down an open road, but we will do anyway. And the fact is, neither do we fancy riding down on the limit. On paper, you'd think there might be a difference between them. The one has rim brakes neatly hidden away behind those very slippery fairings. The NS1, on the other hand, has been designed from the ground up with disc brakes and only disc brakes. Yes, that means braking performance is much improved in poor conditions, but it also means that you can run wider tires, up to 30 millimeters, in fact. So not an out and out gravel bike, but that's plenty big enough to venture away from tarmac should you wish, or run lower pressures for a comfy ride and shed loads of grip. It's time for the final showdown, a flat time trial. 
the ultimate out and out test of speed for any bike and a test that the Ventum 1 was designed to unashamedly excel in. The slight compromise in making it heavier because of losing the down tube and seat stays, well, that, that doesn't matter here. In fact, the, the only slight issue is that well, Sai has taken the tri bars off and put drop bars on. But... Seriously, Ollie, you have got to let that go, mate. You are going to get me in trouble if you keep going on about it. Yeah, well, I mean, they're probably not going to notice. No. Anyway, this NS1, though, should not be underestimated because while it might be UCI compliant, Ventum say they spent 500 hours honing the design in CAD, FEA, whatever that is, and CFD, plus a further 40 hours in the wind tunnel to make sure this is as aerodynamic as it possibly could be. Even the fact that the cables are completely hidden is going to save, what, like a watt or two. And when I say completely hidden, I mean completely hidden. I mean, I literally don't know where they are. I'm going to have to take this apart and find out where they've gone. This one looks faster though, doesn't it? Well. I don't know, mate. I really am partial to the red. That is fast. Are you ready? Yeah, Beep. 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 Do my own then. Beep, beep, beep. Didn't think we'd spend all day outside in the cold by the roadside, did you? We've come inside for a brew. That's right. Now, just to recap the results from our climb, they're on screen now. The question is, how much did our hyperbike manage to recoup on the flat time trial? Well, Si, on both runs, I did 325 watts. Nice. Right. And on the superbike, I did it in eight minutes, two seconds. Okay. On the hyperbike, seven minutes, 53, so what, what, nine seconds quicker. Nice. Not a huge amount, but I mean, if you extrapolated that to a 40 kilometer time trial, that'd be pretty pretty significant, I think. Yeah, what, well, just over a minute, isn't it? Because ours was about 5K. So the difference in my runs was slightly less, seven seconds between the two bikes, but I covered the distance fractionally quicker as well, so I guess it's still within Ballpark. the realms. Yeah, similar, similar. Absolutely. So, we have found that our superbike has the edge when climbing. It probably has the edge when descending, but we couldn't test that because of rogue sheep. And then the hyperbike clearly has the edge on that fast, flat time trial. Intriguing, but what do you think the results actually are? <laughs> <laughs> well, for my money, mate, I think a superbike should be a fantastical round. In fact, if we created a radar diagram, we can see that a superbike should tick all the boxes and perform well in all areas. There might be slight fluctuations, I guess, depending on whether a manufacturer has actively pursued that 6.8 kilo weight limit or purely gone after aerodynamics, in which case it might weigh a little bit more. But I think for a hyperbike to make any perceptible performance breakthrough, it's gonna have to specialize. If it's super lightweight, you won't get your disc brakes and you won't get aerodynamics. If you go after aerodynamics, you won't make it super lightweight. That's right, and, and although we love to blame the UCI for stifling bike design. Yeah, and sock height. And sock height. You, you can't escape the fact that the classic double diamond frame is a very elegant 
and simple design solution to a two-wheeled vehicle that has to steer. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, when you add in things like the best materials currently available and advanced manufacturing techniques like EPS moulding, and actually you end up with a bike that is a genuine all-rounder but that can actually push the boundaries in all areas too. Yeah, and well, as for the one, our hyperbike, yeah. well, I, ha I have to admit that I do love the outrageous look of a, of a beam bike. Um, I just think they look so aerodynamic and kind of futuristic. Uh, to be honest, I'd quite, quite love to just use one as an e everyday road bike. <laughs> <laughs> You'd look very good on it, Ollie. You've also got to give it its dues, haven't you? The fact is, it is incredibly good at what it's been designed for, which is non-drafting triathlons. Benton have been able to make some pretty amazing claims about it, some of which I was thinking would actually translate to my commute to and from work, which is predominantly flat, very fast. <laughs> and yeah. devoid of UCI officials. That's right. <laughs> you want to see the height of my socks when I cycle home from work. Oh, yes. Yeah, but you have to say that to, to most people, they're, they're gonna want a bike that's versatile. Versatility is key, and the all-round performance that is offered by a double diamond frame at the top of its game, it, it can't be beaten. No, performance and also looks as well, because yeah. let's face it, yeah. that's, that's a look that we can all get behind. Make sure you let us know what you think though down in the comments section. We know hyperbikes tend to polarise opinion but what do you think about this latest or are you an absolute fan of that NS1? Get involved. I want, I want the one because then I can win my commute. It's about all I can win. Your commute's quite short Ollie, <laughs> at like one and a half kilometres. <laughs> I think, I think a skateboard would probably do quite well. But anyway, uh, that's beside the point. If you would like to see another comparison video here on GCN, Superbike versus mid-range bike, you can click on screen just now. What do you get for your money when you buy a bike? Because some bikes can be really quite cheap, whereas others can be really, really expensive. But how much better are they? Because after all, you are the one providing the engine. We've looked into this before with road bikes and found that the difference between a cheap road bike and a top of the range super bike is actually pretty big. But the difference between a mid range road bike and a top of the range super bike is much smaller. And that's because bikes that cost around a thousand pounds, euros, or dollars are really, really good. But what happens when you go off-road on gravel? If you spend more money, can you go faster? Can you go further? But also, does it limit what you can ride? And does it limit where you can ride? Now I have a sneaking suspicion that a gravel bike might just be the best value type of bike out there with less separating the super bikes from the mid-range bikes than any other. Now yes, of course, weight still plays a part off-road as does aerodynamics too when the speed is high enough. Yeah, but are there other factors as well that can make a difference? Well, in a bid to try and find out, we've managed to get our hands on two awesome bikes, the Canyon Grail 6 and the Canyon Grail CF SLX 8 Di2. Yeah, so we're filming this with Shimano. As you'll see, both these bikes have Shimano's GRX gravel specific group sets on there. So as part of our look at what separates these two bikes, we're also gonna do a deep dive into the gears and the brakes. Now, we've done this before, Ollie, when we looked at 105 versus mechanical Durace. And in that instance, the difference was not very much. So I'm gonna be really intrigued to find out today's results. How are we going to find out? Well, previously when doing these kinds of comparison videos, we've ridden short and exceedingly painful time trials. And in this video, we're gonna keep doing that. However, to try and answer the questions of what and where you can ride, we might have a couple of other little tests up our sleeves. Test number one is our speed test. A tough little gravel climb to start, followed by a fast gravel section, then onto the road. 
Does anything separate these bikes when they're going quickly? Well, according to the Wahoo side, this is the start of the course that you've designed. Yeah, just through there. That's a hedge. It opens out a little bit afterwards. There's, there's gravel, Ollie. This is, this is gravel riding. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. All right. Beep, 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 beep. God. Oh, damn it. Oh. Good luck, mate. Thanks. Oh. A bit moist mm. under, under Gravel. Tire. There's no it, gravel here. It's a, it's a max effort, Ollie. Right, so whilst Ollie is out getting his first time on the scoreboard, I thought I'd take the opportunity to start talking through some of the differences between the bikes before we actually see what those differences might be out on the road and the trail. So I'm gonna start with the big one, the handlebars. No, I'm only kidding. Handlebars are clearly very different, but no, the big one for me is the frame material. So this, the CF SLX, our superbike, is made out of carbon fiber, whereas the Grail 6 is made out of aluminium, as mid-range bikes typically are. Now that has a big effect on the weight. So the frame here is just 830 grams, whereas our Grail 6 has a frame weight of 1,540 grams, so almost twice the weight. But then whilst that's significant, so too are the material properties in terms of stiffness and compliance. So carbon fiber can be engineered in a way that gives it real stiffness in one direction for power transfer and good handling, but then also allows you to engineer in a degree of flex on another plane. Now you can see it most clearly actually up at the seat post here where it will flex significantly in that direction, boosting comfort, but yet it's really stiff in that direction so that you can actually pedal on the thing. Now, of course, aluminium does deflect, of course it does, but much, much less. What's gonna be interesting though, is to see whether or not we can actually time a difference between the two. Certainly on a normal gravel trail with average size bumps, 40 millimeter tires here with about 34 PSI in, you can feel the difference between the bikes, but could you actually measure a difference? Could you go faster with more compliance built into your frame? We're gonna find out shortly. Before we damn aluminium too much though, it does have its advantages, not least the fact that it's on bikes that don't cost as much. The other thing is that it can, and in this instance is according to Canyon, slightly more robust so it's a little bit less susceptible to accidental knocks and dings. So you don't need to take quite such good care of your mid-range bike as you would do your superbike. Right, run number one, superbike, coming up. Now, neither of these bikes promises to offer any aero advantage, although the Superbike does have aero wheels, which hopefully will give some slight benefit. But in a road situation like this, by far the biggest things are the rolling resistance of the tires and also the position of you, the rider, that you can get into. And on that last point, the position on both of the bikes is pretty much identical. Both have a nice long top tube and a short stem, which means that you can have both nice stable handling when you need it, but also short, nimble, agile handling when you're off-road and navigating the rough stuff. And you're still able to get into a nice aero position with your elbows bent and you can tuck your head in and go faster when you need to. And while I appreciate Many gravel riders probably aren't that bothered about aero. I mean, you can still go faster for the same effort when you want it and be more efficient and, well, potentially go further for the same effort as well. Right, Ollie? Yeah. Run number two. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. Good stuff, mate. Look after it. They're what? falling off. Okay. <laughs> right, ready? Yeah. Beep. 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 Oh, let's go into the hedge again. For God's sake. Oh, 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 oh. I don't know 
why, but every time I get on a bike that Ollie's been riding, I have to put it in the big ring again. Weird. Right, you ready? <laughs> Low blow, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna go now. That was loads of fun. Let's see where Sai is, see how he gets on. <sighs> Hear me, first impressions, Ollie. I didn't think, I didn't think I was gonna notice much of a difference, but I felt it was actually like pretty big, pretty big difference between these two. Yeah, I felt like I felt like that one was so much smoother. Yes. Like, like I know for a fact that the tires are the same pressure because I pumped them up myself. Same tires as well. Same tires, but it feels like it's kind of got, it's like a magic carpet in comparison. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's got full like suspension going on or anything, but it is it, noticeably when you're on like really rough stuff and more compliant. And then on the road as well, even on like the sort of slightly imperfect tarmac, it, it noticeably just more plush. Yeah, um, ride. That's, that's weirded me out actually. Me. Yeah, that has been that significant. Also, the weight on that I think was noticeable, or the lack of. Yeah. So the weight difference in these two bikes, right? 1.2 kilograms, which is quite a lot. I mean, that's you know more than a, a bag of sugar. Um, yeah. And if you so we did some maths. I said did some maths. Stuck it on an internet online calculator, but apparently. That 1.2 kilos is worth about 40 seconds up Alpe d'Huez, which is always my kind of like standard time. <laughs> now we've not ridden that up anywhere near Alpe d'Huez, but I think off-road, a difference in weight, because you're not riding at a constant speed, you're constantly changing your pace, especially yeah. on like slower technical stuff. I think a lighter bike feels more responsive. Yes, it? on that initial section on this test loop you've created, there was at the very least a, per a perception that I felt I could feel the, the, the lower weight immediately. How much difference it made, might not, it might have been like a second or two, but it, you, it's definitely perceptible. Well, let's find out. The results for our four kilometer mixed surface loop are as follows. On the aluminium grail, I completed the course in 13 minutes, five seconds, and sided it in 12.45. Switching to the lighter carbon bike with greater compliance, we were both quicker. I managed the course in 12.41 and Sai 12.37. Test number two now is going to be a little bit more technical. So we've got a kind of bumpy-ish climb up through the woods here. And then we've got a really nice single track descent. Relatively simple, but with a fair few rocks and roots thrown in. And it's slippy out today, isn't it? It's been a little bit damp um, and it's going to get more damp because there's a small stream crossing as well. So uh, yeah, it's going to be good. All right, you, you can go first. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Shall I do my own bleeps? Beep. Beep. Oh, I thought Beep. that was a long one then. <laughs> he False cheated, start. so that doesn't count because he jumped the, the, jumped the start. <laughs> Time for my run now. Pray for Ollie. Oh, sh beep, 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 beep. Oh, sh
More technical riding requires greater control of the bike and this is going to put a bigger demand on the braking and the shifting. So let's talk about the components that are fitted to the two bikes. Starting with the similarities. Now despite the difference in price, both bikes are fitted with hydraulic disc brakes and I think this is just incredibly important. Hydraulic disc brakes, they offer great modulation, more power and more consistency over cable actuated disc brakes. Also cable actuated disc brakes, you can be more prone to cable stretch and things like that. Both the bikes have 11 speed cassettes with a nice wide ratio on there and they both have two chain rings up front. Although you can swap this out on both bikes for a single one by chain ring setup if required or if that's what you want. And that's because the rear mechs, the GRX rear mechs that are on both are compatible with one by setups and they feature this clutch mechanism which you can turn on and off. And the clutch helps keep the chain nice and tight on the rough stuff and stops it slapping into the chain state. Both pairs of levers on the bikes have been adapted from Shimano's road group sets to better suit the demands of mixed surface riding. You've got a wider lever blade here and also the pivot point on the lever is different too. So it can give you greater leverage when you're braking from a hoods position like that. And just the overall shifting on the bike should be very similar because the ramps uh, on both the chain set and the cassette are engineered to be the same shape. So we should have nice smooth shifting on both the, uh, well, less expensive bike and the super bike. So Ollie has just taken you through a long list of similarities, but there are differences, of course. So this one, GRX 810, is lighter than GRX 400, so that's going to contribute to the overall lighter weight of our bike, which is a bonus. But for me, perhaps the biggest one is that GRX 810 is DI2, so it has electronic shifting, which means it's even faster to shift, takes even less effort, and is even more consistent and it stays that way as well. There's no chance of getting sticky, gritty cables from dust and from mud and things like that. Now, will it make us faster? That's hard to prove. I suspect it will very subtly, but let's face it, Fabian Cancellara used mechanical shifting and he went pretty fast. Although it's got to be said that all pro cyclists using Shimano now are on DI2. Why? Because it feels nicer and it is faster and it does take less effort. But even more important than that for me is the fact that when you remove all the mechanical shifting gubbins from inside the lever body here, you can make it smaller. And that for me is really important. I love a small lever body. I find it more comfortable and I also find it gives me more confidence, particularly when I'm handling technical terrain. Now again, will it make me faster? possibly fractionally, but then a comfy saddle doesn't make you faster compared to an uncomfy saddle, but I would definitely choose one. And for me, lever ergonomics is right up there alongside saddle choice. Yes, it's that noticeable. For me, I find a small lever body satisfying every time I ride. And yes, that does sound more dodgy than I thought it would. Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> on our technical loop, the results were as follows. On the aluminium grail with mechanical shifting, Sai completed it in 4 minutes 42 seconds. And I was a bit slower than that, with uh, 5 minutes and 51 seconds. And switching onto the carbon grail with electronic shifting, Sai went quicker, 4 minutes 35 seconds. Whereas I, I was only marginally faster, 5 minutes 49 seconds. We've had a cracking day bombing around in the woods. It's been great fun on these gravel bikes and there are differences between them, but what does it all mean? It's conclusion time. It is. Well, as you say, there are differences between them. We measured it, although we've got to put a big caveat in. It's kind of subjective, isn't it? We're not using power meters. I don't think it would be appropriate to use power meters in this instance, but the fact is, the differences that we did measure against the stopwatch also tallied up with the way we felt about the bikes, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, we were both quicker uh, in both instances on that bike. And I think it, 
but not by a large amount. And I think it's a bit like a, a kind of luxury car versus a, a normal car in that when you get in an Audi or a BMW, you're not gonna get that much faster to your destination, but it just feels nicer. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think I know what you mean. I don't have the luxury of driving either of those cars, but I can imagine what it feels like <laughs> to, to drive a Beamer or an Audi. But no, certainly when it comes to bikes, I understand what you mean because yeah, this bike would technically get you to your destination slightly faster, perhaps slightly fresher, a result perhaps of, of the compliance, of the faster shifting, of, of the lighter weight, but yet actually the most rewarding part of it wasn't the result against the stopwatch, it was every time you kind of stamp on the pedals or you dive for a corner, those little micro rewards that you constantly get, you do notice the difference and it's particularly contrasting every time you swap between the bikes. Yes, I think being able to swap immediately between them really does highlight it and it's good that we've got that luxury. But when we did the technical thing, the biggest difference I found was, was not the bikes. On the super technical stuff, what held me back was my own ability or lack of. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the ability to get off your bike quickly, to, to walk for a bit. All right. I think, yeah. But there's also, actually, we've got to say, the super bike is brilliant for gravel riding, of course, but that bike potentially it's better for all round versatility. Yes, I think this one is a more versatile option because I'd be much more comfortable locking this bike up in town because it costs much less money. And also, when, I, when we were on the, the rough stuff, I'd be much more confident about abusing this bike on rough terrain if I owned that one because it is that bit more expensive. I'd be worried about damaging it. I'd be worried about you damaging this one as well. I, no, I just, I don't, I don't think you would, but I know what you mean. You have to be able to ride what you can afford to replace. And off-road, that's particularly true because stuff does happen. Now, I guess when it comes to answering our initial questions, can you go faster on the superbike? Yes, you can. Can you go further? Theoretically, you could because of the extra compliance, but I can't imagine a situation where our mid-range bike would cause you to, to finish your ride early. Like I just, I just don't think that would ever happen, but you might be fractionally beaten up when you get there. I guess whether or not it's worth that extra money is entirely down to you, your personal situation, and your perception of value. But it's undoubtedly fantastic news that the difference between them isn't a huge chasm, is it? Both bikes are seriously fast, seriously good, and seriously good fun. I like the color of this one better as well. See, I don't. I think this one's great. I like the way it shows off the mud at the end of our day now. It just looks cool. Uh, anyway, that's beside the point. Super interested to hear your thoughts on all of this. You've seen all of our comparisons on the road. Let us know what you think now about this mid-range versus superbike on gravel. <laughs>